We are so glad to have uh, you with us today, especially on the American Cancer Society's Great American Smokeout Day. It's important to highlight this day that encourages smokers to quit as over 30 million Americans uh, still smoke cigarettes and smoking remains the single largest preventable cause of death and illness in the world. Also, given the current climate, uh, it's important to consider that those who smoke or have a history of smoking uh, are at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19 as well. Ultimately, the day is about support, about providing guidance and providing resources for those wanting to quit uh, tobacco. That being said, please welcome our event speakers. Our first is Miranda Spitznagel. She's the director of uh, the Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Commission at the Indiana State Department of Health and has been in her role since 2012. She previously served as the Director of Program Evaluation for the Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Commission, formerly the Indiana Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Agency, for 11 years. She has experience in tobacco control program evaluation, public health policy, strategic planning, grant writing, and program monitoring and evaluation. She was responsible for providing overall program management of the Indiana statewide comprehensive tobacco control program. Our second, <laughs> Crystal Russell, is the program coordinator for Knox County Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Coalition. Crystal has been in that position for a total of six years now. She has a master's degree in criminal justice, and prior to joining the coalition, she was an adjunct faculty member at Vincennes University teaching classes in Homeland Security and Public Safety. <clears throat> Crystal enjoys working in tobacco control as it gives her the opportunity to help her community while also making great friendships along the way. Crystal and her husband live in Vincennes with their two pet cats, Presley and Xavier. Thanks for being with us today. And we'll move on to Miranda's presentation. All right, Gage, how does that look? That looks good to me. You see slides, right? I see slides. <laughs> Great. All right, well, uh, thanks for having me. And um, it's, it's good to be with you today again, especially on today being the Great American Smokeout um, as a way that we do try to support those battling a tobacco addiction to at least quit for one day as a starting point. So i um, thrilled to be able to, to be with you today and, and share this uh, presentation with Crystal, one of our really strong tobacco control coalition coordinators at the local level. So my goal here is to kind of really paint this, the um, foundation for what we do at the, the state level for the tobacco prevention and cessation. And as a reminder, this is our current uh, mission statement for our program specifically um, for tobacco prevention cessation. I'm really just trying to reduce the burden that tobacco places on um, all Hoosiers. So I wanted to start with a little bit of um, just context about Indiana and where Indiana sits and um, some of the other challenges that I think get layered on that are connected to um, our unfortunate high rate of tobacco use. Um, I'm highlighting here a publication from the Truth Initiative, which is a national foundation that supports a lot of tobacco control work across the country. And a couple of years ago, they looked at this, um, uh, uh, several states and sort of how several states could hung, hang together and um, went under this term called tobacco nation. And not only are these states traditionally high in their adult smoking rates, but we, they also were able to find some correlations with other poor health indicators and other poor um, or lower levels of, of, of income, education, life expectancy. And again, as we know, um, a lot of correlation between uh, smoking and some of these other social determinants of health as well. So that's just kind of a backdrop, I think, to some of the work that we do here in Indiana and, and some of the challenges that we face. What, one of the things I, I love personally about the field of tobacco control and have since I've been in this field um, is just the 
overwhelming uh, level of science and evidence that supports the work that we do. Uh, this is a, just a quick illustration of the numerous Surgeon General's reports on smoking and tobacco, the best practices guides for what it is that we do at that state and local level to really impact uh, tobacco use. Uh, we, we know how to do this work and the research and science really points to that as well. Um, so it's, it's great to stand on this level of evidence and be able to try to implement this to the best of our ability again at this at the state level. Uh, another way of talking about what works in tobacco prevention cessation is, is what we call the tobacco control vaccine. And this came about um, from some leaders within the CDC Office in Smoking and Health in response to that question about, gosh, wouldn't it just be great if there's a vaccine that we can inoculate all of our children to so they wouldn't ever try a tobacco product. And, and the thing is, is that we have that, but we just have it in this layered, multifactorial uh, approach to tobacco control. And we know that we need all of these components working together um, in what we call this tobacco control vaccine. So making sure we've got, and I'm going to talk through some of these elements, you know, um, continuous hard-hitting media campaigns so folks know of the harms of tobacco use and where to find resources. Um, no barriers to, to tobacco treatment, supportive smoke-free environments, and then high prices of the products and ways that we can reduce access to the products. Most recently, um, just last month, there was a publication that really added to that and what's called a vaccine booster. And so those of us who work in public health can kind of relate to this analogy. And it really speaks to all of these layers and policy strategies related to the retail environment. And um, we could have a whole talk really about point of sale um, tobacco marketing and how it influences not only adults to continue smoking, but in, entices young people to start. But these are some strategies that, that are working at the state and local levels across the country, and again, as a ways to reduce that access and exposure to, to tobacco products themselves. So how we apply a lot of this uh, research and all of these things that we know if, that we get from the, the national level is a strategic plan. Uh, these are four priority areas in which we operationalize through all, all of our community grants and the programs that our state program supports. But the idea is that really any, to, um, any community partner, any statewide partner who has an interest in working on tobacco issues could find some strategies and some things that they could work on in, in all of these four priority areas. So I just thought I'd talk through a little bit about each of these and maybe give you some, some high level uh, context to some of the things that we work on at that state and local level. So related to youth tobacco use, what we're talking about is really all of these products. You can see a variety, whether it be um, cigars and cigarillos, um, nicotine pouches, smokeless tobacco, e-cigarettes, all of it. So while there, um, you know, we've seen a lot of focus on e-cigarettes in, in the last few years, we really want to make sure that we're doing a holistic approach to addressing all of the, the products that young people are exposed to. Uh, we've had some great success over the years, and this is just a quick snapshot of us monitoring um, youth smoking, cigarette smoking since 2000. You can see this huge decline, and I think this is like a great success to celebrate. Um, unfortunately, you see with those green bars going up, since we've been tracking e-cigarette use among our young people, you know that, that we've increased by about 350% during that time frame. And that, um, a lot of the other, things to keep in mind is the fact that the more and more research comes out about types of products that young people in particular are using and that most of those who of those using a tobacco product are using a flavored product um, not only with e-cigarettes as you can see here about two-thirds of those but any type of tobacco product that you may see um, you again just that the, the people that are the kids that are using these products are typically using a flavored product, which is which is one of those key messages that we're trying to get across in some of our communication. Uh, in addition, the exposure not only are they they enticed by flavored products, they're also enticed by a lot of the marketing they see 
and these are data from our 2018 youth tobacco survey. We're currently collecting data here in 2020 to get some updated numbers. But um, you know, you can see that these young people are still exposed to marketing in probably ways that us as adults may not even be aware of. And this is just a quick snapshot of things that you might see on your corner stores in some neighborhoods. And I think um, a lot of our local partners are really um, taking a, um, advantage of the fact that they do have some local images and some local data to share and share with their community members about some of that marketing that really all of us are exposed to. But as you think about um, the young impressionable uh, folks in our communities and in our families, uh, this is very much a concern, I think, as, as we know that there's, you know, uh, thousands of tobacco outlets around our state. As we have a Going back to e-cigarettes for just a moment, as we were, you know, knowing as, as those trends were on the increase, um, several national publications, um, Surgeon General reports and advisories came out of really drawing attention to the epidemic that has has resulted on e-cigarette use among our young people. And here in Indiana, we knew that we needed to take a robust, comprehensive approach when we saw that dramatic increase that I that I shared earlier on the chart. Um, with the support of Governor Holcomb and State Health Commissioner Dr. Chris Fox, we were able to launch an initiative called Vape Free Indiana and took, um, you know, these, these three elements really focused on um, some key things that we could put out into the state and at the, at the local level to, to do what we can to, um, again, educate our young people through the curriculum of catch. We were able to support some trainers. Um, to be able to be trained throughout the communities to be able to share this with our schools developed a, a peer education program called Sweet Deception, where a lot of our youth leaders have been trained to be educators themselves and be able to deliver that message to their peers. We, um, about a little bit, uh, almost a year ago this week, uh, launched our first flight of the Behind the Haze campaign, um, partnering with a national um, entity to be able to run this campaign here in Indiana. Uh, we're rounding out our third flight, which is a spot called uh, defenseless. Uh, I'll share that in just a second. And um, and then doing what we can to get out services about quitting. Uh, the Indiana Tobacco Quit Line is a, is a steadfast, ongoing uh, resource for, for anyone looking to, to, to seek help for tobacco use. Um, but what we've done specifically here for, for youth and young adult vaping is partner with the Truth Initiative to get out this message um, that there's a text messaging program just for them and all they need to do is just text Indiana to that number and get enrolled and, and start to engage in some resources that way. So all of these things working together, we continue, uh, continually update the Vape Free Indiana website um, and really try to tailor not only updates on all of these three areas of, of the initiative, but also based on uh, the audience. So whether you're a parent or educator, you should be able to find some key tools and resources there. Um, in, in addressing this issue about vaping among our young people. And, and here you can see that screenshot of the, the ad defenseless. You can find it easily on, on YouTube. Um, what was nice about this spot is that it really drew that connection between uh, vaping and lung health overall and the concern about how that reduces and lowers your immune system. Um, and again, that potential of, of illness. The, updated behind the Hayes website. Uh, you can also find some resource for young people about how they can quit vaping. Um, not only to, um, this is quitting resources, but others as well. And then finally, as I kind of wrap up just the e-cigarette, um, this is kind of a really quick snapshot, but there, as what we've seen um, nationally that we may also see here at the state level, I'm not sure they found that there was a dramatic increase in the class and the category of disposable e-cigarette products. And I'm just showing this quick illustration here so you kind of know what to look for, um, know what we're talking about when we say disposable uh, e-cigarettes, but there's been a dramatic increase in the use of these types of products among our young people. And so something that we're being, um, that we're monitoring again at the state level. Indiana um, fortunately was able to implement its uh, Tobacco 21 law on July 1st. And again, that raises the tobacco sale age to 21. 
and partnering with other state agencies, we're able to develop some of these resources. You can find these on um, the Tobacco Prevention and Association website. Um, if you're wanting some, some signage or some uh, frequently asked questions to not only educate yourselves or get those out to the community level. Um, but again, this is just another tool in our toolbox that we're gonna be able to, to utilize um, in the, now and in the future to really reduce initiation or the potential initiation among tobacco among our young people. And then finally, um, you know, voices are um, youth empower the brand of our youth empowerment movement. It's really work looking to engage youth at at all levels of, of engagement at that local level, to you know, educate them, empower them on the issue, really um, give them the power to use their voice at their community level in order to make change. So really proud of the work that um, voice and those local groups have been doing uh, across the state. Um, moving on to, to secondhand smoke and smoke-free air, specifically on e-cigarettes, you know, we want to make sure that folks know that that vapor on that end of that cloud of that e-cigarette is, is not harmless water vapor. We want to make sure that we're in cigarettes and all forms of tobacco smoke and all of our strong smoke-free air laws moving forward. Um, and, and as you can see here with a lot of this gray on the Indiana map, we've got a long ways to go in protecting all workers from exposure to secondhand smoke. And um, again, that's that's the great partnership that we have at the local level for them to educate their the local community organizations about the ability for them to make those local changes. Not only do our folks work at, um, at the community level, but also working to um, support uh, apartment complexes, multi-unit housing um, entities about the ability for them to make their housing units smoke-free. Uh, we know that that smoke for air doesn't know or secondhand smoke doesn't have a have a barrier. It, it, there is no barrier to secondhand smoke exposure, and so that you know things seep through doors and windows and vents, exposing um, others, not others, and you know children and non-smoking individuals to exposure to secondhand smoke. So this has been a great growth in our area across the state, starting with um, supporting the implementation of public housing. It's um, smoke free. Uh, public housing, but also being able to send that throughout um, other, other forms of multi-unit housing. Uh, and then uh, finally, kind of going back to, to school engagement as well, um, making sure that first and foremost, as we try to tackle and educate folks on e-cigarette use, that we're making sure comprehensive policies exist um, for the community level, making sure that they also include e-cigarettes. So, this um, county map just gives a quick snapshot. It really illustrates the proportion of school districts, um, public school districts within that community who have 100% um, tobacco-free campus policy. So blue is 100% of all of those school districts. Yellow is some, um, red is, is not having any at all. And so you kind of see where, we, where we've got some work to do in some of our communities. So, oh, you know, why do we talk about smoke free air so much um, from a, a strategy and a priority area is that we know it um, not only protects non smokers from exposure, but it also supports quitting. And again, just kind of bring it back to the fact that, you know, today is a great American smoke out. Um, it is that ability for folks to start with today's being day one. Uh, great resources, obviously, with our, our state tobacco quit line. Um, I often talk that it's probably one of the best kept secrets. It's it's a fantastic resource, and I know that many partners around the state are doing um, a lot of outreach to make sure that everyone knows that it's available. Um, and and we also had this year again another Surgeon General's report on uh, specifically on smoking cessation released at the beginning of the year. And um, one of those key takeaways was not only utilizing those resources like state quit lines or evidence-based tobacco treatment, um, including all of those medications that we know work. Um, but also just that reminder that it's never too late. Uh, quitting smoking is beneficial, again, at any age, and, and we know what works. And so it's one key message, hopefully, that, that we can carry into our day. Um, Gage said at the top of the program, we know that there's this connection between um, smoking and COVID. So all the more reason, especially in this time, what we're trying to do everything that we can to keep our family members um, and friends safe is to really support them on their journey to becoming tobacco free, especially in this context of, of 
um, concern related to the coronavirus. Our state tobacco quit line has a 43% quit rate, really strong. This is the highest that it's been since we've started the state quit line. It's been, we opened the quit, state quit line in 2006. So really strong um, program results and um, know that um, those who have used it are really satisfied with, with the resources. So you should feel confident in re referring or mentioning this resource to any, anyone uh, throughout your work. I, I kind of started the beginning with Tobacco Nation and how we typically have high rates of tobacco use, and we do. I think you can see here in this, um, the bar chart illustrates the Indiana data. The blue line is the United States median. Um, you can see Indiana is typically higher than the rest of the United States, unfortunately. Um, uh, on the bright side, we below 20% for adult smoking rate for the first time ever. Being in the right direction. Um, but, uh, you know, essentially there's still well over a million adult smokers in the state of Indiana. Um, so we definitely have a long way to go and, and um, we have it within us and we know what works in order to make that progress. Um, so while, you know, almost one in five Hoosier adults are current smokers here in 2019, I did want to point out the fact that we know that um, these are high um, these are specific populations within our state that have even higher rates of smoking. And, um, you know, our charge through our community program is, is to really make sure that we're engaging um, organizations that serve and, and reach a lot of these, these priority populations, being creative in how we outreach uh, to, these, to these individuals. Um, you can find on our, um, I wasn't able to go into the detail here with some of the data on each of these populations today, but all of, um, you can find some additional detail on our, our state website on the tobacco prevention cessation sheets that really um, get into greater detail about um, the tobacco use rates among these priority populations as well. So certainly a concern and I think in our next five-year strategic plan, you're gonna to start to see a lot of more focus on um, ways that we can really dig in and serve better some of these um, populations as well. So as I wrap up, this is really always my favorite slide to share with people. Um, you know, we can't do this without strong partnerships, not only at that community level, but as, as well as with the state level. And um, it takes all of us working together. So we are blessed to have many state and local partners in this effort. And um, this is just a quick snapshot on, on some of our reach that we have throughout the state. So with that, you're going to go down here to Knox County, and I'm going to um, hand the program over to Crystal. While Crystal gets set up, we actually had a question here in the box. And feel free to unmute and, and ask as well um, while we have a few minutes. Uh, Lori Gert asks, do we know what percent of individuals that are referred to the quit line accept services? Assuming that 43% is of those individuals who accept services or accepted services. Yeah, great question, Lori. I don't have those data off the top of my head about who actually accepts services. I think a lot of times in our outreach, as we educate um, community partners, healthcare providers, and, thing, and things along the way, you know, we certainly always want folks offering that resource of 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, it's also a part of the conversation that I think um, specifically, you know, using healthcare providers as that, uh, as an example, want to make sure that they're um, doing a little bit of motivational interviewing, that perhaps that they're talking to that individual about, um, their willingness and readiness to quit as well. It's also a key part of it. So um, it's definitely a partnership in getting that individual across into the journey. But um, first and foremost, we want healthcare providers to ask, um, ask the tobacco question, ask if they're willing, advise them that this is the best thing that they can do for their health, and then certainly refer. And um, the referral can take place in a lot of different ways, but we want to make sure that people know that these resources exist um, and, and support them in doing so. Great question, great question. We'll give it another few seconds to see if anyone wants to ask anything else. And don't forget, you're welcome to ask at the end as well. I 
think we're ready to go if you are, Crystal. All right. First of all, thank you very much, Gage, for inviting me to be um, part of this great uh, opportunity uh, this afternoon here on the uh, Great American Smokeout as we uh, encourage folks to start with day one today in their quitting journey. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about some of the work that we are doing um, here in Knox County. So just kind of to give you an idea of some of the things that we do and some of the things that we don't do because we often um, get asked this question. Um, so what we do, we work, as Miranda said, on smoke-free and tobacco-free policies. So that can be with businesses, organizations, schools, multi-unit housing within the city or within the county. Um, we here in Indiana are not preempted from passing a law that is stronger than the statewide smoke free air law at the local community level. So we're able to um, assist with that. We also do point of sale assessments. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's looking at that tobacco marketing at the point of sale. We also do um, school presentations on marketing, um, tobacco, vaping, all of those things um, as well within our school systems. We conduct community outreach. We work and engage with a lot of our community partners um, to reach the community um, on a variety of topics, um, you know, not only tobacco harms, vaping, smoke-free air, secondhand smoke, um, but also just leading healthier um, lives, which is, is our desire for our community. We also meet with both local and state elected officials to talk about the work that we do um, and where we can work to make things better for the state of Indiana and for our local communities. We also promote, um, heavily promote the Indiana Tobacco Quit Line um, to our healthcare providers, organizations, businesses, and also advocate for health systems change within the local health systems. Um, so utilizing that ask, advise, refer process uh, with each patient each time they see them. So a couple of things that we don't do, um, we do not offer the free NRT. And we also do not do one-on-one -on -one cessation counseling. Um, that is what we utilize the quit line for since that is the state line. Um, I am the only person in Knox County who does this work as a paid employee. So um, it would be difficult for us to do that one-on-one -on -one cessation counseling. And so that's where the, the quit line um, is a great option because uh, folks can call in there 24 seven and have access to someone to help them as they are on their quit journey. We are, um, blessed here in Knox County, we do also have the freedom from smoking classes that are offered by our local hospital. So we, we have an additional cessation resource within our community that can help. So um, uh, the mission of the Knox County Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Coalition is to simply make our community healthier by preventing and reducing the harms of tobacco use and secondhand smoke exposure through education, policy, and of course, lots of advocacy. A little bit about the coalition. Once again, I am the only uh, paid person who does the coalition work, so everybody else is volunteer, um, and I have to give a shout out. I know at least one of my, my coalition members is on here today, but I have to give a shout out to my coalition members. Um, this work could not be done without them, and many of them um, are in healthcare, and so this year has been particularly trying for them, but they have stuck with us, uh, the coalition, doing our work, um, have continued to be committed to, to meetings and other things that we are doing. And, and so I have a really great group um, of volunteers who help continue this work um, every day, despite um, this year being quite challenging and a lot of hardships. We do have one subcommittee. Um, it is the Breathe Easy Vincent's committee, and I will get more in depth into that committee um, here later on in the presentation. We have been serving our community for over uh, six years, so the coalition has been here um, and has kind of continued to grow over those years. Um, just some of our, our member organizations include um, Good Samaritan Hospital. Uh, they are a, a, one of our key members, um, do, a, do a lot of work with us um, and help us out a lot. Pace Community Action Agency, the Knox County League of Women Voters, uh, Metronet, uh, MD Wise, Anthem, Purdue Extension, Vincent University, Lincoln Hills Development through their Healthy Families Program, and Children and Family Services. And once again, this is just a snapshot of some of the organizations that help out our coalition um, each and every day in the work that we do within the community. So I kind of wanted to highlight two things. We do a lot of things within the community, um, as Miranda alluded to earlier in her presentation, but I kind of wanted to highlight a couple of particular points um, for our coalition, and that is the STARS and our work on point of sale, and then also our Breathe Easy Vincennes work. So to give you a little bit of background, if you're not familiar with Knox County, um, our population is about 36,000 uh, people, a little over, just shy of, of 37,000 here in 
uh, according to 2018 census data. Vincennes is the largest city and it is the county seat. Um, most people know that we, we are right across the bridge, uh, basically from, from Owensville, Illinois. Um, so people are generally familiar with, with that. Um, we are a largely rural area, especially when you get into the northern and southern parts of our community. Um, it's largely rural. We, most of, of our other areas within the community are either townships, unincorporated townships. We do have one other city um, of Bicknell, but it's much smaller than Vincennes. Um, so we really are largely rural. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say we were Indiana's first city um, because we are proud of that history um, and the history that we have here within the city. We do have several um, tobacco-free policies in place at organizations and within our school corporation. So Good Samaritan Hospital um, is one of those, as well as the Samaritan Center. And then our three public school corporations, um, Vincent's Community School Corporation, North Knox and South Knox, um, all have those good, strong, comprehensive tobacco-free policies in place. Our smoking rates, um, as you can see, are higher than the state um, average here in Knox County. We have 21.3% of our adults who smoke. Um, so that's an estimated 6,439 smokers. Um, we have an estimated 69 deaths that are attributed to smoking annually. Um, so that is something that we really, um, you know, like to, to let our local officials know that, hey, we, we, we've got a problem, um, and, but we can fix that problem with sound policy solutions. And then um, we have about 18.9% of our pregnant women smoke. Um, that's a number that we've really focused on um, as the coalition because that's one that um, we, we really would like to drive that number um, down to much lower numbers because we are one of the higher counties within the state for smoking um, during pregnancy. So that's one that we continue to focus on. So the, now that I've kind of given you an idea of what Knox County looks like, we are rural, we are small, um, but despite that fact, we still face many of the problems that you might suspect in larger communities, especially when it comes to tobacco use, and especially when it comes to vaping and our kids. This is a photo from one of our local school corporations of e-cigarettes that were confiscated from students within that school corporation. Um, as you can see, there's all kinds of variety um, that they had. This would be a, a middle high school is where um, these were confiscated. However, with that being said, um, late in the day, just this past Friday, we received a urgent email um, from someone letting us know that a third grader um, had been caught with a vaping device. And so um, we were able to provide some educational materials and some ideas to, to help educate that student on the harms of vaping. But even though we are rural um, and, and it wouldn't, you wouldn't think that we would have the problems with vaping um, among our youth like they do in larger cities and, and areas where these items are, would supposedly be more accessible, um, we do. And we're seeing it um, in our schools as well. So that leads me into point of sale. And so just to kind of give you an idea of what point of sale is, the point of sale marketing is basically the point where you buy the product. So when you walk into a convenience store, um, a gas station, a mass merchandiser, wherever that may be, and they have the big power wall of tobacco products there, that is the point of sale. And so we go in and uh, do assessments at the point of sale. And this picture, I apologize, it's a little grainy, it's an older picture, um, but when e-cigarettes first came out and we were doing some um, store assessments, we saw something that bothered us. As you can see up here, the sign says smoking cessation. What's a little more difficult to see is right under that sign, um, this particular retailer had all of the e-cigarettes right under that sign. If you look a little bit over next to the e-cigarettes, there is the actual FDA approved cessation product, but they had slid the sign over just enough that it, these appear to be smoking cessation products. And so these are the kinds of things that we see. You can also see, um, you know, if a young person or someone who's trying to quit was looking at this, um, you know, this makes them think safer for those who are young. You can see down here, here's a roll, plenty of candy down here, People Magazine, those types of things that might um, draw the eye of a younger person. We know here in the United States that there was about $8.6 billion spent in 2017 
on tobacco marketing. Out of that 8.6 billion, nearly $8 billion went to the point of sale to market these products at the point of sale. That's about 92% of the tobacco industry's marketing budget goes to the point of sale. So that's why it's so important. And that's why we go in and conduct assessments to see what's going on locally at the point of sale. Um, you, this picture here is also from Knox County. Um, as you can see, you save 50 cents when you buy two. Um, this is very common for us to see um, those types of advertising here in Knox County. We did the STARS assessment, which is the standardized tobacco assessment for retail settings. And the data that I will be sharing with you today is from our 2018-2019 assessments. Um, as with many things, we were unable to complete um, the 2020 assessments due to safety precautions being taken um, as COVID started and, and things started shutting down because we usually do um, our assessments kind of February through the beginning of April and that's that's when things were kind of shutting down in our state so we were not able to get those completed this year so um, I will be sharing data from the last couple of years with you today but over those year two years time span we have completed 36 store assessments here in Knox County out of those 56 percent of the stores assessed were the convenience stores 14 percent of stores assessed were mass merchandisers and then we also have assessed tobacco shops, grocery stores, uh, pharmacies, liquor stores were also assessed. So we assess a variety of stores. We don't just focus on one particular type of store. So what did we find when we did these store assessments in Knox County and what do we see in Knox County? We see lots of different products, tobacco products that are sold. We also see unfortunately flavored tobacco products and we also see price promotions which make these uh, products even more consumer friendly um, with those price promotions like we saw before. So <clears throat> just to kind of give you a, a, an idea here, Knox County will be in the blue line. Um, the other counties, which was 43 that participated in store assessments uh, during the 2018-2019 assessment year. Um, as you can see, cigarettes pretty much on par with what the other counties were seeing. Um, the little cigar cigarillos, little cigars as well. Um, we we sell a little bit more smokeless tobacco um, within our our community. We have those products available, and then also e-cigarettes. You can see that we also had um, those products available, seventy eight percent to to sixty six percent when looking at all of the the counties that completed assessments. Um, so we definitely offer a wide variety of products. Um, I will tell you. You know, oftentimes when we go in these stores, we do have um, vapor stores within our, our community as well. Um, but oftentimes when we go in these stores, um, you're amazed by the type of products that you see because we as adults, and I know myself included, and especially now um, with COVID going on and taking extra precautions when you're out in public, we often don't realize the types of products. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not a tobacco user or you're not a young person, a, a child or a, a youth who is absorbing information and looking at things we often don't we're, we're busy as adults we run in we pay for our gas we we buy our drink we do whatever we go out and we don't really look at those types of products and so I know it's been eye-opening my coalition members volunteer um, as part of this assessment process and so I know it's been eye-opening for all of us to see the different types of products that are actually sold within our community um, and we always come back with interesting stories um, as well during our, our assessment time as well. So, um, but I know for us, it's always interesting just to see what's out there. And then we looked at flavored products. Um, as you can see, again, we sell a variety of flavored products um, here in Knox County. Of course, cigarettes um, can no longer have flavors except for menthol. So we look at the little cigars, cigarillos, um, which are often very inexpensive and offered in a variety of flavors um here within our community and then also smokeless tobacco um e-cigarettes and then premium cigars which we did not have as many flavored um premium cigars in knox county when compared to the other uh 43 assessments that were completed but definitely um e-cigarettes and the little cigars cigarillos we, we see those in our community as well so if we look at price promotions um you can see we offered quite a few price promotions um, uh, we saw those um, on cigarettes and then also e-cigarettes. 
where we saw in the stores that we assessed there was some type of promotion. So whether that was a buy one, get so much off, um, or whatever the, the price promotion might be, we did see that. Um, and even with menthol cigarettes, um, we did as well. So um, the little cigars, cigarillos, tend to be relatively cheap within our community, we've noticed. Um, so usually you can get you know, a couple for 99 cents. They're very, very cheap products. So we didn't see as many price promotions with those, um, but definitely across the board with some of the other items, um, we did see those price promotions, which once again, um, we know who those who have lower incomes often smoke and use tobacco products at much higher rates. And so those price promotions are really key. And also for you, um, if a young person has to decide whether to, to buy you know, get cigarettes or get e-cigarettes or even a young adult, because we do have a, a college age population. If they have to make the decision whether to buy tobacco products or to buy that pizza or to rent that movie, um, you know, they might tend to do the other things, but when these products are cheap, it makes them more accessible and easier for them to purchase. So why does all this matter? When we look at point of sale, um, and that's a question, you know, that we, uh, we like to ask ourselves is, is why, why does all this matter? Why is it so important that we go out and do these assessments? And, and as Miranda said, um, you know, to, to the tobacco control vaccine, the, the booster shot um, to that is point of sale and, and looking at this point of sale and coming up with good sound policies to address point of sale. Um, now that, unfortunately, in the state of Indiana, um, addressing things like marketing and stuff, that, that is a state level thing we cannot change laws here at the local level to address marketing um, like we can with smoke-free air policies um, but still it, it's vital that we get this information and share it one with our community but then this also provides an opportunity to share with both state and locally elected officials um, this information as well to let them know hey this is what we're seeing in our community yes we're largely rural yes we're, we're a smaller community than a, a lot of other communities within Indiana but this is what we're seeing here and so it's so important because we do know that it, it, it encourages youth to start and especially um, that marketing, especially when those price promotions are there and those flavored products. Um, we also know it makes quitting much more difficult. So for adults who are trying to quit, um, if they go in there and see that power wall of tobacco products, that can be a trigger um, for a lot of people. And um, you know, a lot of people don't realize just how difficult it is to quit. And of course, we're out in the community a lot. And, and so we have those conversations with folks a lot about um, how they quit or, or why they decide to quit. And I will tell you, we've had people who have been quit for 20 years plus and, and say, you know, if, if cigarettes came out and they were not harmful or they knew that they didn't have very much time left on this earth, they would go smoke a pack of cigarettes. That's how strong the pull to that nicotine still is after 20 years quit. Um, so it does, seeing those products being inundated with that marketing, may, you know, and the, the marketing is made to make it look wonderful. You know, the, the marketing, it's always bright colors and it's always cool pictures and it's celebrities and it's all these types of things. And so that can make it much, much more difficult to quit. And then we also know that there are some communities that are definitely targeted more than others by the tobacco industry. Um, and that's another reason why this is so important to continue to look at the point of sale and look at these marketing tactics. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk about one of our largest uh, projects that we're doing here um, in the city of Vincennes. Um, Breathe Easy Vincennes is a breakoff subcommittee of our coalition. Um, it's largely comprised of coalition members. We do also have um, a community member that jo has joined us as well. But this is our committee that will work to pass a strong smoke-free air ordinance for the city of Vincennes. Um, we currently do not have a smoke-free air law on the books here in Vincennes. And so this committee is working to get that changed, um, to close some of those gaps that were left by the statewide smoke-free air law, to address um, e-cigarettes, because as Miranda alluded to, we know that um, the secondhand aerosol is not safe. And so we would like to address e-cigarettes as well. So we are working on gathering support for this work. We're meeting with our locally elected officials. Um, we're working, which has been much more difficult uh, in COVID, but we're still working to educate the community about the harms of secondhand smoke and the benefits that Smoke Free Air will bring um, not only to our community, but also to the workers in our community as well, who are still being exposed while on the job. 
Um, our little slogan that we've created is smoke free air, we need it. Um, so if you find us on Facebook, you will see our post with that. And that has uh, been our mantra because we do need smoke free air for, for our community. And especially I think during this time of the current pandemic, we've realized just how important health and especially lung health and respiratory health is um, to our communities and, and to our folks. If you are interested and you would like to support our smoke-free air efforts, um, we do have a change.org petition up and the link is included there. Um, please get on and sign. We would love to have everybody um, get on and express why they support uh, smoke-free air for the city of Vincennes. We would like to show our local elected officials that, that folks do like smoke-free air and do want to see smoke-free air within our community. And so that that is a, a goal that we continue to work on um, and we'll be happy to let everyone know when we um, achieve that goal uh, here in our community. If you do have more questions and would like uh, more information or to see if you would you have a locally funded partner because that's the two things that I mentioned um, are really just a snapshot of the work that we do. Um, I know our coalition and many coalitions um, around the state really work as an act as a resource when it comes to tobacco control. And that has always been our approach is we want to be the resource. We want to be the, the go-to stop um, for information as it relates to tobacco control. So if you're interested in seeing if you have a locally funded partner or someone close to your area, um, you can visit the Indiana State Department of Health Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Commission. And we have a, they have a nice uh, pool down there so you can look at your community and get the contact information for your local coordinator. And then if you are interested in learning more about the work that we're doing um, here in Knox County and uh, learning more about us, please visit our Facebook page. Um, you can find us by visiting KCTPCC or you can email me um, at the email listed below. And with that, I will thank you all for your time and give it back to Gage. Thank you. Great presentation. <clears throat> Learned a lot of great things about resources at the state level, uh, you know, quitline rates, state smoking data that really set the foundation then for you, Crystal, to come in and then talk about the significant work your group, uh, your coalition's done, and, um, you know, the assessments such as the STAR assessment, a lot of the great findings you've done in your county. I thank everyone for, for being here today and, and, and uh, listening to our presentation. This is a chance to um, ask any questions or just bring up anything if you would like before we end our presentation here in a minute. Feel free to add that in the chat box or come off mute if you'd like. If we don't have any other questions, uh, I'm, I'm sure our two presenters would be willing to answer any uh, post session for you as well, if you'd like to, um, to reach out. Um, beyond that, I want to thank everyone for coming today and being part of our, our webinar. Um, again, remember, this is the Great American Smokeout Day. Uh, you know, it's all about that, that day one, empowering uh, those around you and those who have a desire to quit, but just haven't quite gotten to it yet. Um, Again, with that, thanks to everyone, and I think that's the end of our session.